Welcome to the new video. Uh, you see uh, at this moment a white canvas, uh, whiteboard, and we're going to try something uh, new today. Instead of uh, you having to look at my face while I'm talking, I'm going to produce for you an animation uh, with text, only text, and I'm going to explain what I'm actually writing down and why it is important in the study of uh, Neja and also Taoist uh, arts. This first video is uh, one of uh, five chapters. They all belong to one uh, session. Um, not exactly sure at the moment when I am busy producing this, how long it will take to make it, because uh, producing it is a little bit more difficult than I thought. I don't have mo stop motion uh, equipment, and it takes a lot of measuring, and the tools that I actually uh, uh, purchased for doing this uh, movie in fact, they don't uh, work because their coding is not uh, similar. In these uh, five chapters, I'm going to explain the relationship of Neja to Taoist training, which steps you have to take and which trainings you have to do. Then the sequence will be followed up by basic training as a course, like what is the minimum that you have to do to make a good start uh, in relationship to the Taoist program, Taoist training in general, and uh, other things that uh, come across. start somewhere so we will start with uh, Neja. Neja in itself is a complicated term even though it seems very easy. The most common translation of Neja is internal arts. But in fact uh, the translation as such is uh, wrong. Uh, it is not uh, internal martial arts or anything like this. Neja literally just means internalizing family. And this is basically what it explains. It is the family of practices that are helping you to internalize. And there is something peculiar about this also, because the word ne, uh, internal, can also mean internalizing. Uh, the Chinese language allows for a word to be both a verb and a noun. And as a result of that, uh, it can mean two things at the same time, and it does mean two things at the same time. It is not an either-or choice as it would be in our language, but it is an and-and proposition. And that is very important to realize. Like for instance, you are sitting on a table, uh, this is called uh, a table, and then when the, at the moment when you are sitting at the table, you are tabling. Uh, this word does exist in uh, English language, uh, it's not very often used, it is an uh, archaic language, but the word table and tabling then, in that case, in Chinese case, would mean the same. And the same thing with uh, ne. Ne means both internal and internalizing. So the internal is related to the process of internalizing. And in this case, it is about uh, jia. And jia then has to be seen in the family of words like uh, dao jia, ne jia, uh, and so forth and so forth. And dao jia, in that sense, belongs to concepts like dao jiao and dao shu. Tao Jiao is Taoist teachings, and Tao Shu is Taoist arts. So the answer we're going to try to find in these chapters is in how far Neja also is Tao Jia, and uh, how far Ne Shu, and that is the most important one, also is Tao Shu, Taoist arts. So let's recognize first that uh, in opposition to Neja and Ne Shu, which are uh, complementary terms, uh, there also is something like uh, Wei Shu and uh, Wei Jia. And Wei in this case means external and externalizing. So in opposition to Ne Jia and Ne Shu, there's also externalizing and uh, externalizing arts and externalizing family. These, this opposition is very important because in uh, Chinese culture, uh, putting things in opposition tells you a lot about uh, things in itself. Uh, very often people see yin and yang as opposition and in a way they can be opposition at the same time but they're also complementary so the neja and the weja is more or less the same a nice example here is the difference between uh, shaolin and uh, uh, wudang uh, martial arts 
uh, where the Shaolin is supposed to be external and the uh, Wudang is supposed to be internal. And the saying is, uh, during the practice, the Wudang and the Shaolin are different, but in the end goals they are the same. Which is not exactly right, because uh, Shaolin is about mental stability and uh, the Wudang arts are about uh, permanent life. I think that uh, discernment uh, also deserves a little bit more explanation. In uh, Shaolin uh, martial arts and uh, different kind of other trainings that uh, relate to uh, the Chan and uh, Buddhist uh, principles uh, that are at the foundation of uh, Shaolin uh, practice, um, the preservation of the stability of the mind is most important to prepare you for the moment of death and maintenance of the mind to become a Buddha. Um, the idea of the Bodhidharma was that uh, if the body is not firm and strong like a mountain, then at that moment, uh, how does the mind preserve itself to become an immortal Buddha? And uh, this is at the heart of uh, Shaolin practice. So the physical prowess and the strength actually is all of non not relevant. The mental stability is very important. And at the moment when Shaolin just becomes martial arts, in that sense it's not anymore Shaolin, it's just army practice. In Wudang exactly the same. The preservation of life is most important at the moment when it becomes martial arts. It actually is not anymore Wudang martial arts, it's not anymore Taoist art anyway. So we already have made a big discernment between Buddhist, uh, between the normal uh, Jia and, uh, and the Nei Jia and the uh, Nei Shu. From Taoism and non Taoist schools. So we will discuss about that later. The purpose of uh, Wudang in that sense is to become so much lively and uh, movement at the same time that you become one with heaven uh, so that you are becoming permanent. The interesting thing about uh, Wudang uh, Taoist practices is that they go back to uh, Chang Sang Fen. Chang Sang Fen was a student of uh, Lu Dongbing. Uh, but the uh, location of Wudang Shan is mostly occupied by Longmen Chuan Chen Tao and Chuan Chen Pai. And this is a monastic uh, grouping uh, where monastic practices and monastic alchemy are most important. And where Chang Sang Fen is uh, basically a side track in uh, Taoism. So the Chang Sang Fen uh, transmission of uh, internal arts in itself is already relatively unique and is a little bit of an underdog in uh, Wudang itself, even though it is uh, the main reason why it has become such a big, unique tourist attraction, similar like Disneyland. One more footnote I would like to make is that uh, Weijia, Neijia, as uh, Shaolin and Wudang is concerned, is uh, common to be used, while in fact uh, I have my doubts if I should see uh, Shaolin practice as a uh, Weijia uh, because in effect mental training of course also is a form of internalization only it is a limited form of internalization because it stays only in the mind and uh, Neijia mostly refers to the internalization of the whole body and the mind and our behavior and in that sense there's also at this time anyway difficult to make a discernment between Neo-Confucianism and Taoism because Neo-Confucianism at a certain point also accepted the use of meditation. And that also means that the er earlier discernment that we made between uh, Neja and Weja as being uh, sports, uh, school sports and uh, Wudang sports is better. The dashed line that we add here is the separation between Neja and Weja. What is very important here is that there is of course a certain overlap between Neja and Weja because both apply the body to have a particular kind of result. And the Neja learning process usually is slow because the body learns tricks very slowly. Usually it takes about three months of permanent practice or continuous practice anyway to learn a new trick. So it takes a lot of time. But the uh, way Jia, even though refinement is very important, uh, you can learn to hit a person very quickly. And this is basically what is being applied in the army training, military training and sports centers. You have to learn in a very short time particular kind of tricks. And then you have to rely on force to actually achieve something. While in Nei Jia, uh, uh, relying on smarts uh, very often is uh, more dominant. 
so here we go further with the uh, narration and we make another separation from Western language, which is esoteric and exoteric. In a way, based on what I said before, we can say that uh, Neja is esoteric and uh, Weja is exoteric. Eso means inside and exo means uh, ex outside. And of course, this is the reason why Ne is usually translated as uh, internal, because Eso means internal and exo uh, means external. The separation in that sense is uh, insufficient. So although esoteric and exoteric can be used as terms to explain the difference between neja and weja, uh, they are not synonymous. Uh, they just partly overlap and they are partly uh, comparable. Uh, that uh, weakness in comparability uh, also leads to a lot of confusion. And you see that esoteric does not mean internalizing, but it basically means mysterious uh, to most people uh, or hidden uh, occult uh, in that sense. And exoteric basically means uh, outward, uh, being shown in how we manifest things and how we do things. Uh, while esoteric more is about the relational things between ourselves and others or uh, the divine. So however much I would have liked it, I would have liked to, for convenience purposes, I would have liked eso to put esoteric on the top of the line at the Neja and exoteric uh, as a Taoist uh, uh, on the bottom of the line, below the line, uh, but uh, this is a false notion. Uh, Taoism in itself has many different kind of schools and as it is divided into three cavities, uh, each of these cavities has esoteric and exoteric teachings and it depends very much on the nature of a person, how, which direction uh, you might prefer. Like for instance when I'm teaching uh, the Bamboo formula, Qigong, uh, this is a both an esoteric and exoteric practice, but it becomes an esoteric practice because of the link with the, 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 with the Dan Dao and the alchemical practice. When you just practice the Bamboo formula, Qigong for health reason, uh, it just is an exoteric practice. They're both Taoist practices, even though they use a Confucian form language because you uh, focus on the external form of things, you don't pay attention to the details like the Dantian and so on and so forth, all the alchemical aspects. Um, also the movements because of the straight lines, these are specific for Confucian practice because uh, yeah, the ritualization of movement that becomes very important. And the ritualization of movement in itself is an exoteric practice. Although uh, the practice of uh, ritualization of movement can lead to the sensation of internalization. Let me give you an example. Uh, for instance, uh, you have to wash the dishes. When you don't feel very much like washing the dishes, it just becomes a job, a task that you have to perform. At the moment when you ritualize it, it is just something that you become mindful of. And at the moment when you become mindful of it, it becomes like a meditation. So even though it's an external practice when you are just washing your dishes, at the same time because of the mindfulness you become attentive of the space around you and inside you and the effects of the movements of the performance. So as a result of that it also becomes esoteric at the same time. So you see the esoteric and the exoteric is not so much only in the practice of things but it is also in the mindfulness of things. And uh, people who know me, they know that I very often complain about modern mindfulness cultures. That is because it usually leaves out the ritualization aspects. It tries, just tries to become you mindful, make you mindful about some of your emotions and your feelings. And that is actually not the purpose of mindfulness, both in Buddhism and in Taoism. The purpose is that you ritualize your movements and your actions so that you become uh, aware of all the different kind of things that play a role in life. When you are doing the Ne Dan practice and you are studying the uh, production of the Dan Tian, for instance, then at that moment you have to become aware of what happens inside you. And because of the awareness of what happens inside you, you gradually develop uh, acute awareness of all the minute changes. And these minute changes actually are all relevant uh, in the learning process. So that's actually what it's all about. So let's continue to the next uh, slide which uh, adds the point of non-Taoism. Well, you've seen it already in the picture. I already added the word non to Taoist. Uh, the last part to be discussed is uh, then what actually in Neja and Neshu 
make something uh, Taoist or uh, non-Taoist. The discernment actually is uh, relatively arbitrary in the sense that uh, everybody can practice Taoist arts, but it doesn't make you a Taoist per se. I think uh, we have to define that something becomes Taoist because of, uh, first of all, the goals of Taoism, but also the context that Taoism offers as a belief system and as a worldview. And it means the inclusion of all kind of practices that relate to that, uh, through which uh, Taoism at least claims that this is how it works. And that means that you're included in a community that's the Tao Jia. And you follow the Taoist teaching, and that's the Tao Jiao. And then you practice the Taoist arts, and it's the Tao Shu. And this relationship is very important. So uh, what I'm not saying, or what I'm at least trying not to say, is that you have to become a Taoist to do Taoist arts. The only thing that I'm saying is that the community of Taoists around you might help you to actually achieve that goal of uh, becoming an immortal, as is uh, the purpose of Taoist practice uh, in a self-directed sense. Uh, of course, being a Taoist entails a lot more because it also entails to become a moral person and then all these kind of other things that relate to uh, Taoist uh, worldviews about how a person should be like uh, to be able to achieve that immortality. And it is also then like in Wudang, your service towards other people. And this is uh, an essential part of uh, the why Neja or Weja should be Taoist or non-Taoist. It has to do with the whole world view. And you don't need an initiation to do that. You can live like a Taoist and so on and so forth, as long as you're strict and disciplined about it. And then you can gain the respect of other Taoists as such. Because, uh, of course, a Taoist who is doing these kind of things should recognize it in somebody else too. In the next uh, chapters we continue with talking about Tao and the relationship with uh, Wutang also and we will go into the Neja practice and what you need to do to start your Neja practice uh, from the beginning and I hope uh, it's going to help you to be a successful practitioner even if it's only for your health. So for now thank you for watching and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talk to you again next time uh, if you're not uh, yet a Patreon member, then please become a member of my channel to follow the other chapters. And uh, um, thank you for listening and uh, your attention. And uh, I look forward to meet you soon.